I'm sure you're looking so happy about this. <laughs> we're so, just, we're shocked. so baptism in, in our tradition is, is really a dedication because we make promises on Logan's behalf until he's old enough for confirmation and to make the promises himself. You want to look in here, Logan, and see what we got here. Is a little bit of water. You want to touch? That's easy. Go ahead. It's all right. I won't tell. Yeah. And so when we make promises on Logan's behalf until that time, and so let me ask you that on Logan's behalf, do you have faith in Christ as your Savior? Yes. And will you lead a life so that Logan can grow up and share this faith too? Yes. Yes. Are you going to come to me? Can I? Will you come to me? Can I hold you? No? Is it a good idea? I don't bite. Do you bite? Do you bite? Sometimes. Sometimes. Say hi to everybody. Say hi. 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 You wait. He's going to So this is the water of baptism, Logan. But again, it represents God's Holy Spirit being poured out on us. You remember when Jesus himself was baptized, and he told us to be baptized too. Can I put my hands on your head? What's the full name given this child? Logan Matthew Burns. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Normally I'm getting baby kiss, but I'll just blow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we as the people of faith make some promises today too on Logan's behalf. We promise to be the church for his sake, to be his Sunday school teachers, and to be his his example so that he can go out to share our faith. Let me give you going back for a minute and then let's join together in prayer. Let's hold hands. Will you, will you reach out towards someone near you? Loving God, we thank you for the awesome responsibility you give us to be creators of life with you, partners in birthing and guiding and growing. And we just pray that you'll make us faithful disciples on Logan's behalf. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stay right here with me for a minute. And so, members of the household of faith, I commend your love and care, Logan, whom we this day recognize as a member of the family of God. Will you endeavor so to live that he may grow in the knowledge and love of God through our Savior Jesus Christ? With God's help, we will so order our lives at the example of Christ, that Logan, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith. And confirm and strengthen in the way that leads to life. Amen. Amen.
We've come to our time of prayer to intercede on behalf of one another. I have two concerns that have been shared with me. Uh, Donna Guinea reached out to me to let me know that she'd like us to keep her brother Ronnie Bailey in our prayers. And Melinda Doyle would like us to keep her cousin Sherry Taylor in our prayers today. What other joys or concerns are there today to share? Last week, I know that we listed all of our graduates in the bulletin, but I didn't lift it up and, and speak about it. So congratulations to our graduates. I have two grandchildren who have graduated preschool. Too body, I think. I don't know. Are there other joys or concerns? Well, let's go to the Lord together in prayer then. God, you are the creator of tree and flower, and child and parent. And we thank you for the surpassing beauty of the world in which we live when we take time to appreciate it. We are, we are awed by how it all works together and in cycles of death and life and new life. And so we thank you for such relationships of kin and kind that enhance our sense of joy. You truly are a God of wonder and of love, but there are some who are troubled in our world of flowers and love because they're looking at it with the eyes of those who know they must leave it. And so comfort them, we pray, with the presence that makes all of life one, both in this world and the next. Some are disturbed because they can't own the world, because ambitions are unfulfilled, are unrequited. Help them with us to discover the joy of little things, to delight in what they have. Some are unable to, to fend for themselves and are indeed oppressed. And so we pray that you would give us a heart to share what we have. Some are unable to regard the world in all of its beauty because of poverty or hunger or imprisonment or prejudice or judgmentalism. Minister to the needs we ask, to our means and the means of others, that we may all be joined together in praise of your name and the world that you have envisioned of indeed your reign, your kingdom come. And let this congregation be a part of the redemption of your dream for all humankind in which there will be no more pain or hunger or personal estrangement, but only love and fellowship and grace. We ask it through Christ our Lord. We taught us to pray together. Whenever we pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Today's Bible verse is Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 34. Verses 26 through 29 are referred to as the parable of the growing seed. He also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. While I'm sitting here, because we had the baptismal font here in the chancel today so that we could be a part of the recording, uh, I'm flashing back to when I was on the staff at the Manchester Church as the third associate, and it fell to me to lead worship the Sunday after all of the events, after Christmas, after Easter, and after Pentecost, and the furniture was always gone from the chancel except for the one baptism font, and for security I would hold on to it. <laughs> Hopefully I don't need that today. I want to say uh, 
greetings to everyone who's worshiping outdoors and in cars or even an automobile honk your heart this morning. Oh, there's some. Good. God bless you for being here too in that respect. In that respect. So our lesson today has to do with the growth of the kingdom of God and the nature of God's kingdom. We have a problem in our backyard at home. There are herds of deer. They're wonderful. In fact, I said at one point I was going to put a salt lick on the fence. I remember when I used to go visit uh, Oscar Wieland. They would have a salt lick, and the deer would sort of stand in line and take their turns to lick it. It was kind of fun to watch. But uh, several folks said to me, you don't want deer ticks getting on your labradoodle, so, or your golden doodle, so we didn't do that. But the deer uh, in our neighborhood like to eat everything that flowers, of course. It's what they do. Lynn said on the neighborhood Facebook one day recently, a neighbor put out all of her annuals, and she was mad on the Facebook page. Someone snuck in her yard and tore the tops off of all of her flowers. She wanted to know which neighbor was responsible. <laughs> it was the deer. So Lynn, who has a, a rose garden in the back and other blooming things, read that if you put a pot of, of mint, a growing mint, peppermint, uh, on the edge of the of the flower bed, that that will uh, attract the deer. But what did we discover about mint was that it hopped over the sides of the clay pots and it turned itself into a ground cover in the flower beds. Did it go to sleep, Dave? I'm talking to you. I put the screen to sleep. I hope I don't want everyone to sleep. <laughs> The mint is an invasive plant, and that's kind of the point today, that God's kingdom is like this invasive plant called the mustard seed, the smallest of seeds. But if you plant a mustard seed, it's so prolific, apparently, that after a while, all you have is mustard. It overtakes everything else. This parable, which Betty read, is from Mark's Gospel today, but it happens that it's also in Matthew and, and in Luke. Those are called the synoptic gospels. We're going to spend some time in coming weeks in sort of a Bible class during worship time. And I want for us to learn some more about these things regarding the scripture. Mark is thought to be the oldest of the Gospels. Mark traveled with Paul in his missionary journeys after all. And it's thought that the other two synoptic writers, synoptic is where it just means that they synchronize, they have the same sort of timeline. It's thought that they had Mark in front of them when they wrote. And, and John, he's just off on another planet because the fruition of John's gospel was much later and during the time when philosophy like Socrates and Aristotle, were, I have a degree in that stuff somewhere along the way. I like John's gospel, but it's different. It's just the fourth gospel. But in Matthew and Luke, there is another addition to the story about the mustard seed. Here it comes, fancy. Is it coming? Do I have to click again? Here it comes. <laughs> Jesus says, in addition to the mustard seed, according to Matthew and Luke, the kingdom of God is also like yeast, like leaven that someone sows into a loaf of bread. Who are the makers in the congregation? We don't have any. <laughs> I'm not going to make, make, make a cake. I just wanted to know. <laughs> it's like this. Here, I'm proud of this time lapse. I got in the blue fire. This is God's kingdom. This is what Jesus said. Mystically, magically, it rises. Let's do it one more time. This makes me want a yeast roll. It makes me want to go to Lambert's. The last time we were at Lambert's, it's been years ago. I think it was my 40th birthday, so it's been years and years ago. My sister was there, and they threw the roll to me. Have you been? And I tried to throw it to her, but she missed it, and he hit the guy behind her right smack in the head. And he turned around and threw it back. And I threw it at someone else. We started a role fight. We can't go there anymore. <laughs> Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like this. It starts small. And mystically, magically, then, it grows. Remember how the story of Christ began. We might have thought since God was sending a savior, since God was sending a Messiah, he would be in Herod's palace. That's where the wise men went anyway. But Christ was born in humble estate, born in a cow trough. I'm talking about Christmas to make us feel cooler today. <laughs> God's kingdom starts small like this, Jesus says. And that is meant to be good news to us. We're looking for God's reign. And I always think about the book of Isaiah when I talk about God's reign. Isaiah says the lion's going to lie down with the lamb. 
They won't study war anymore in God's reign. The prophet Micah says they will beat their swords and their weapons into plowshares in God's reign. This is the reign that we're praying for and hoping for, the rule of God. It starts small. It begins, as a matter of fact, not in David's palace. And Isaiah might have given us the wrong expectations when he said the government will be upon his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Now you can help the Messiah with me. The King of Kings. David's throne will be established. And so the Pharisees might have been excused when they thought that Christ was told to be the Messiah to have expected him to be more like David than to be like the humble person that Isaiah describes when he talks about the suffering servant. But Jesus says the kingdom begins like this. It doesn't begin on the throne. It doesn't begin with lions and tigers and bears and, and fanfare. It begins within you. The kingdom, Luke says, begins in the human heart. And so God's rule begins to reign in the creation when first it reigns in me and in you. And yet, despite this humble beginning, Matthew says that the gospel of the kingdom of God will one day reach the whole world, just like the mustard seed, just like the lump of leaven. God's plan is from these small beginnings from what you and I have to contribute and offer for God's reign of peace and justice. The prophet Micah says, after all, what does God require of you but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly? This is what it looks like when God's kingdom rules in my heart and your heart. And it's what God wishes for the whole world. And so Jesus began by calling 12 disciples. And from that, the gospel spread. All of these disciples, by the way, except for John, were martyred for their faith. John died in exile. That's why he had a little bit longer to write, perhaps, in John's gospel. And then we're told on the day of Pentecost that there were about 120 people gathered with the disciples when the Spirit descended upon them. And that Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit is what birthed the church. That Holy Spirit is what gives the miraculous growth that we're talking about of God's kingdom. And so the Spirit gives the growth, but we must do something. There's something that we need to do to be receptive to God's Spirit. And so I wanted to conclude this morning with the notion of the spiritual disciplines. There are traditionally six spiritual disciplines that we can practice that, that give the Spirit that miracle growth in us and in our kingdom. Wait a minute. Wait for it because I'm proud of this. Here it comes. There is an acronym that I want to use today. Is that cool or what? I had fun with that. Never mind. Growth. It's an acronym I want us, acronym I want us to think about. G stands for going to God. We did it this morning. I'm preaching to the choir even though there's not a choir there yet. Someday <laughs> we'll get back to a kind of choir program. Go to God. It simply means that we need to practice the presence of God. You know, it became apparent to me even more in the past year when we didn't meet in this room that this space is set aside among us as a, as a holy space. It's the space where nothing else goes on but worship. Uh, it's the space that we reserve for a place where we expect to experience the presence of God. And, and we, we kept this space holy and humble and waiting for us to get to come back. This is our Mecca. <laughs> this is where we want to come together to experience God's presence together. Going to God means something more to me these days too. I have become burdened in my heart, and I hope you are too, with, with the violence that we've been seeing so much in the community. How many times has somebody blown up on an airplane and gotten mad and had to be subdued in recent weeks? How many shootings have there been in the city of St. Louis? I can't take my mind off of the little six-year-old boy who was in the back seat of his mother's car in road rage. His mother said, he said, ouch from the back seat, and then he was gone. You know, the New Testament's favorite phrase, I think, is when God says, vengeance is mine. <laughs> vengeance is mine. It's as if God trusts us with everything else, but he doesn't want us to go there to go to God and trust God for vengeance is a way I think that we might finally become a less violent people, to trust God toward justice. And you know what? Mostly God will change our heart instead of changing the situation. But the first spiritual discipline to give miracle growth to the rule of God in our lives and in the world is to go to God, is to let God be the one whom we trust to establish justice. R is for reading God's word. 
Uh, I've been reading it to most of you every day for several months now. Uh, and that's part of my plan. The, the website is BibleGateway.com, Bible Gateway, where those verses are listed if you ever want to read ahead that I've been using it and commenting upon a little bit. And I, I thought, uh, as I thought about sharing this notion of reading God's Word today, for years, I mean, to the point where the first Bible, uh, recorded Bible I had was cassette tapes that I used to play in the deck of the car. And when there wasn't anything on radio, I would pop in a Bible tape. I was a nerd. And, and then I had a CD set for a while. It was called Faith Comes By Hearing, the CD set that I had. In fact, when we got Lynn's car, I moved that set of CDs into her car. And when I sat out the driveway to put one in, I realized there wasn't a CD player in the car anymore. <laughs> I called the dealer and I said, did we buy cheap? What happened? He said, uh, sir, most people don't use those any longer. So there's an app for that. I guarantee uh, you can find an app. There's an app for listening to the Bible. It's a wonderful thing to do to become familiar with God's Word. But the thing about becoming familiar with God's Word, we can learn history, we can learn stories, but we're called to apply God's Word. Read God's Word and to apply God's Word. And in the coming weeks, I want for this principal hour worship at 10 o'clock to become a time when we talk about just what is involved in applying God's Word. I think we can do a much better job of that as God's people and as the people of God. In the Methodist tradition, Wesley says it this way, there are four ways that we apply the words, reason, tradition, and experience, and our personal experience, and then, and then just reading God's word in general. There, are, there is a biblical imagination that's required when we interpret the scripture, and, and uh, that requires humility because we all have different kinds of imagination. O stands for opting for self-denial. This doesn't mean uh, bankrupting yourself in the service of Christ necessarily. There are those who practice intentional poverty and find that to be a spiritual guide. But it means to follow the Spirit's urge once in a while to be generous and not count the cost. It feels good. You've done this. I know you have. It feels good to be generous and to follow the Spirit's urge to give once in a while. Did you see the story? I heard it on the news as I was going out the door this morning. The high school graduate who is going to Harvard. She was a, a, an immigrant from Ghana with her mother who was homeless and put herself through community college. And the young lady gave her scholarship to another student because she already had a ride to Harvard and didn't need it. And she did that on the spot. She didn't know she had won the scholarship until she stood up to give her speed. It, it feels good once in a while to opt for self-denial, to follow the spirit's lead. I was, I was at a funeral visitation at the Schrader Funeral Home recently. And a young girl was misbehaving all over the building. She was just not being still. She was doing worse than Logan's doing, I swear. <laughs> He's doing fine. And I always am, am acclimated to children who misbehave because I used to be one. I sat next to Grandma at church for years and one year is longer than the other. You can guess why. <laughs> and so and there is a fountain there. Where, where, where you can throw coins in and make a wish. And I gave the youngster a quarter. I said, come here. You can throw it in here and make a wish. And she stood there and she groused over that quarter for a long time. And she put it in her pocket and ran off. <laughs> so I tracked her down. And I said, if I give you another quarter, would you feel like you could throw that one in? Sure, she said, mister. And she took it and she walked right past the fountain. <laughs> I went up to her with her mother and I said, she's got two quarters of mine and she didn't throw them in the fountain. Her mother said, give them back. I said, no, I just want to know why she won't throw them in the fountain. She said, I'm saving up to get a candy bar. <laughs> so I bought her a candy bar. And moments later, she came with another little girl. This is my cousin. She'd like a candy bar too. <laughs> the growth of God's spirit musters up in us and it feels good when we sometimes obey the urge to be generous to opt for self-denial Christ after all gave himself for us all the way to Calvary sacrificial love is the way that God's spirit grows miraculously W stands for witness now I know the Lester family in the city from years ago it began with Ma and Paul Lester standing on the corner with an accordion and a tambourine it's been almost 80 years now since that happened. That's one way to witness. 
Uh, they used to mistake me for the writing master in town all the time, but uh, we both got it over and bigger. <laughs> you don't have to do that to be a witness, though. If people know that you're a Christian, you already are one. By the way, even without words, it means to live a life worthy of Christ, just like we talked about here. But the best evangelist I ever knew of was my father. I'm sure I've told you the story before. Dad would meet everyone, everyone, and ask them, where do you go to church? Within the first five minutes, where do you go to church? And you dare not tell him that you don't go, because he'd tell you where I was preaching and invite you to come with him. <laughs> it simply means to be inviting. To witness to Christ, but to, to know, you know, we live in a missionary time. It troubles me, and I hope it troubles you too. That the last Pew Research report said that now in America there are more people that say none when they ask about religious faith than there are people who say that they do have faith. We live in a missionary generation and a missionary culture. It's our calling to be concerned not just for our own personal faith anymore, but for others. It's important for the life of faith. The T stands for trusting God. Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. The conviction of things not seen. To trust God means to step out on God's behalf. The rest of that 11th chapter talks about all the people of faith. Abraham, Noah, Moses, all were called to go somewhere else. <laughs> to leave their comfort zone. And the upshot of what faith looks like, the book of Hebrews says, is all of these people trusted God for a more godly place. A more heavenly place. If they were satisfied with where they were, they could have gone back home. But they were searching. They were searching for the place where God's rule needed to be planted and where it needed to be nurtured and where it needed to grow. To trust in God means that we live like they did, strangers and exiles on the earth, it says. They lived as if they were refugees and foreigners because the world wasn't godly enough for them yet. This is our calling, too, so that the Spirit might grow in us. And finding that age means to stand before God and one another with humility. Do you know this popular passage, Second Chronicles 7? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and confess their sins, I will return to them. The call to humility just means not me first. And I think the pandemic has given us a lesson in how me first our culture is. And so this is our calling, so that the Spirit might grow miraculously in our midst. The Spirit of God is like an invasive plant. C.S. Lewis called it a good infection. And God means to move into our lives and take over. Uh, again, on the news this morning, I heard on the way out the door. Uh, do you recognize that? That's my baby picture. <laughs> In the eastern part of the United States, the cicadas were so thick that you hear all over on the news this week, the radar couldn't see the, where the rain was because the cicadas were blocking it. <laughs> Brought down two planes this week, flew into a woman's car and made her run into a, a post this week. I heard a young man on the news this morning uh, that called himself the cicada whisperer. Did you see the story? He said, it's like, it's like the pandemic. The cicadas have been sequestered for 17 years, and now they're on spring break. <laughs> and they're going wild. <laughs> we need to just appreciate it. By the way, uh, there are recipes where he said they taste like shrimp. Yeah, I knew that would get you. <laughs> the kingdom of God is just like a cicada infestation. I think that's another good analogy. <laughs> it means to take over. My brother-in-law just visited from Atlanta this week. I asked him to bring some kudzu with him. Yeah, he wouldn't do it. I think it's illegal to bring it out of the South. Do you know the kudzu story? Apparently it was introduced at a World's Fair in the South in the 1800s as a way to fight erosion. And now it's called a plant that ate the South. It eats cars and houses. It almost grows like the growth you saw at the beginning of the service while you sit and watch it. <laughs> Let us imagine together this thing today that God's kingdom is like a patch of kudzu. God means to move into our lives and to totally engulf them, to take over. 
And if we might grow in spirit, we will say, here I am, Lord. Take me and use me. In humility, we will say to God, I am yours and yours alone. And we will look for God to rule in our hearts. This is the place to start. And I think God needs us to do that more now than ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. During this offertory time, I'm going to put back up that screen about the six spiritual disciplines. And I'd like for you to think about those in your life then during this time.
Thank mm-hmm. you.